Hello everyone and welcome to my Galileo 6.4x series in Kerbal Space Program 1.2.2. As the name of the series implies, we're going to be having adventures in the solar system created by the Galileo Planet Pack and it's going to be at 6.4x scale. We are going to be doing it in career mode. So we're going to have the tech tree and everything. We're going to have lots and lots of mods involved. And I'm showing you the difficulty settings I set up here. I wasn't entirely sure about how the contracts would work with the fact that we're at 6.4x scale. So while I'm going to be turning off allow reverting flights and a crew respawn, I'll allow quick loading just in case there are bugs. And also at this point, I keep the science and rewards consistent at 100%. But over time, I'm going to be reducing those because I, I, I know what's going to happen. Uh, this is going to be recorded with me doing a voiceover instead of the real-time commentary I normally do on my series. So just a heads up on that. So I've already recorded a chunk of this and I know what happens. So yeah, spoilers. I also decided not to have G-Force limits on because that doesn't work very well with KSB Interstellar. We're not going to be dealing with the KSP Interstellar parts any time soon, but you see me considering those right there, and I turned them off again because it's mainly the warp engine. If you try and go to warp with the G-Force limits on, it tears everything to pieces, so we don't want those on. I could have turned them on now and then turned them off later, but I decided just to keep everything consistent and not have them on from the start. So you see that there. and But we will have the signal for control and plasma blackout. And so yeah, we are not using remote tech. Uh, we will go with the stock antenna range system. And otherwise we have a lot of uh, contract packs. You can see some of the mods that we have on the side there. We do have dang it, though uh, not, not much dang it things happen. So I'll have to take a look at that. Um, at least I, I've had much more mayhem with test flight than with dang it so far. Uh, you can see me looking at the stock contracts. Uh, we need a lot more contracts that are popping up, so I actually edited eventually the contract.config after uh, recording this session in order to have it generate more contracts at the start because with so many contract packs, we ended up getting certain contracts and not others, and I wanted a rich mix of contracts instead. Okay, so there we go. Let's start our career. By the way, the music that you hear in the background will be OC Remix music from uh, ocremix.org. I've got a playlist of it, and I'll try and remember to have a uh, credit for each piece at the top there later on. But uh, here we are at the contract screen, and you'll note that I didn't have the KSC++ Space Center, and that's because with the rescale to 6.4x, they recommended that I delete KSC switcher and KSC++ because the buildings might clip into the terrain and all, so I've done that. Um, I am aware that Scott Manley has a Galileo Plant Pack series. I have not watched that. I did watch people on Twitch playing it, and that's what inspired me to uh, decide to try it out. I waited until I had upgraded my RAM, though, because I have a lot of mods in. I'm going to say that a lot. Um, I have a lot of mods in, and I wanted all the mods, so I needed more RAM. Basically, uh, this particular install takes about 12 gigabytes of RAM to run, so it's pretty intense. Uh, you may notice sort of a bluish filter on it. I'm tweaking that around. I, I got the sense that people have not liked that. I'll think about uh, whether to tweak that or just turn it off. So if you notice a bluish tint, that's because I'm running uh, GemFX for that. So we'll see if, if I keep that or not. But I take a look and uh, that's basically the planet in the Mars location and it looks quite habitable but I'm not entirely sure yet. And just taking an overview of the system and what potential targets we have. But for now we're going to be just getting into orbit. Uh, will take me a little bit of time just like it normally does in career mode. I want to explore all the parts that I've got involved in this series. Of course we've got many more than the stock parts and we're going to be doing crazy things with them. I decided to begin with a sort of traditional fashion. We have this Don't Stay Putnik. I think it's from Lax Stock Extensions. And, well, it, it seems like the right thing to do. And so I try and build a rocket to send this into space. This is going to be our first sounding rocket. And so we just want to get into space. We're not trying to get into orbit just yet. And I want to see if we can do that with uh, minimal cost. I also wanted to have some reusability in all of this. 
So I have that in mind that I want everything to be recovered. So you see me dumping the decoupler there. Well, actually this probe comes with its own decoupler. You can see it in the corner there. But I also decided that I wouldn't want to decouple it. I want to retrieve the entire sounding rocket all together. And try to find a tank that's going to fit right. I initially put a rear guard engine, but that's actually a vacuum engine there. And we do have parachutes, so I'm using community tech tree, but uh, no other uh, tech tree modification. So the parts are just being placed wherever community tech tree places them. And yeah, we've got these little parachutes to start off with so that we can recover this. But I will have to replace that engine because it's a vacuum engine, not a sea level engine, and not efficient at sea level. Even though it produces enough thrust, you can see in MechJab there, sea level thrust to weight ratio is 1.17, so it will get off the ground, but not very fast. And we do want it to go fast. So instead we have the Vanguard engine, or at least the stock iteration of the Vanguard engine. It's actually uh, modeled on the real engine there but that's from stock extensions as well, and three of those fuel tanks and then the parachute. So pretty simple probe right there. And here's our first sounding rocket on the launch pad. And unfortunately, well, of course we don't have SAS, but it starts to tilt. And in a panic, I decide to light the engine. Uh, well, that's obviously not gonna work very well, is it? Um, of course, in stock, normally they can balance on their initial engines because we don't have launch clamps and all. Turns out that with Community Tech Tree, we do have launch clamps to start off with, and I should have checked on that. I also decided to add fins. The Vanguard engine is sort of complicated. It has little vermeer thrusters that are controlled with the RCS. They're basically glorified RCS ports is how it works on the model. So it could steer itself, potentially, but I really wanted it to stick to the airflow, and so I added fins there. Now at this point you might be wondering why I chose 6.4x and the reason is I'm using the stock tanks, I'm not using Smurf or real fuels or anything like that. We're, so we're using heavyweight tanks and we also have stockish ISPs which would be good for a kerosene engine or a hypergolic engine but not really good compared to the more advanced uh, earth engines. Uh, so I wanted something that wasn't quite as big as earth, didn't take quite as much delta V as earth does. but was you know still a sufficient challenge for me and I would still be building the kind of size rockets that I would be normally building and you know same sort of shape same sort of staging um, basically and so I thought 6.4 XL would be a good measure for that because by my calculations it take about 7,800 to 8,000 meters per second to get to orbit with a low thrust to weight ratio kind of rocket you know uh, a calm rocket if you will and that matches up well with the 9,500 meters per second it takes to get into Earth orbit with that kind of rocket. And yeah, I decided it was a reasonable challenge. If I tried to do 10x, I'd probably have to add Smurf or something, which uh, changes the mass of the tanks and uh, something that modifies the ISPs. You can see we did get to a sufficient height. Technically, the atmosphere ends around Gale. This is our... Uh, initial planet, it's not called Kerbin anymore, it's called Gale, at 112 kilometers. So that's where space starts, and we will get to that here. And the next step is recovery, and for that we're lucky in that the rocket is sort of tilting in one direction and going tail first instead of nose first. That's really helpful. It could easily have been going nose first because of the configuration of the fins, but it isn't. I think that's because the Vanguard engine uh, balances out the probe core on the top very well, but uh, here we do flip, but by this point uh, we have slowed down enough for the parachutes to work. Uh, that's lucky, but it's not going to be something we can rely upon. I do have some realism mods like TAC Life Support, but I don't have firm aerospace, which could have made this a bad day for us. We are using the stock re-entry heating at 100%. I don't know how how bad that might be with the fact that we've scaled up the whole thing by by a 6.4x because of course that means that the re-entry heat, heating is going to be more intense coming down and real solar system uh, uses real heat to deal with that to make the calculations a little bit better I don't know if the stock re-entry heating is going to be harsher than necessary because of that we'll have to see so our second flight, our first flight with the modified DB-1A after the dismal failure of the DB-1, 
uh, was a success, so we did get to space, and we do have signs to unlock some technologies, but I decided with the returns on that mission, the fact that we already had 224,000 funds, meant that I really needed to turn down the rewards. Not the reputation rewards so much, I thought that was alright, but I decided to tune down the fun rewards and fun penalties as well. I mean, maybe I should turn up the penalties. But um, at least the fun rewards should be turned down and probably the science rewards as well because 24 is a lot at this stage uh, in the game. So I, I expect that the new contracts we get will reflect those numbers. I'm not sure that's how that works. Uh, it should be the case that the persistent file gets that number in there and then every other contract will have the fun return uh, multiplied by the 0.7 instead of the 1.0. I hope that's how it works. But anyway, we do have science to spend, and so I take a look at the large technology tree that we have, but we continue with basic rocketry and engineering 101 as normal. The only viable contract we had was continuing in the historical progression track with the V2 rocket, but that's basically what we did before, but I figured we could slap on some instruments. Though, because we got this contract before I lowered the fund returns uh, we have quite a lot of funds uh, in advance and for completion of that contract, so that's not so good. At this point, I already figured that we've got a bit of a problem with the whole contract system and that it wasn't giving me a whole lot of contracts other than part test contracts. So we had like nine part test contract missions and not much else. So eventually I'd turn off the part test contract missions and I'll, I'll also eventually increase the number of contracts that it offers us. Now in the VAB you saw me playing around with possibly adding a fairing, but the fairing was larger than the body of the rocket so I decided not to go with that. We did reach quite a height in the last launch and more than we needed, so I figured it'd be okay to slap on a mini goo container from stock extensions as well as a thermometer and it would still get into space just fine. The problem is the center of mass change, which uh, of course now it's heavier on top and more likely to flip so that's pointing straight down. So that's one thing. Another thing is probably I should have reserved some fuel uh, so I could use the vernier thrusters on the Vanguard engine so that we could orient with those. That would have helped quite a lot if I had done that, but instead I let it burn out. I end up doing upper atmosphere science instead, so here's the goo container for the upper atmosphere and the thermometer reading from the upper atmosphere. I'm just keeping those because there's no way to transmit, even though it, it shows a link. Uh, apparently that kind of link is not the kind of link that allows you to transmit data. And it turns out that my assumptions about the performance of this rocket were incorrect, that the Vanguard engine couldn't push this quite out of the atmosphere at 112 kilometers, so we started falling back down just shy of that at 111 kilometers. So this technically didn't reach space as far as Gale's concerned, so we didn't fulfill the contract. And so now all we can do is try and get the science back, but as I have hinted, that's not going to be so easy. Coming back in through 30 kilometers, you can see we are going nose down instead of tail down. And it looks like the Probodobodine State Putnik is very, very aerodynamic. At least a heck of a lot more aerodynamic than the Vanguard engine, which produced a lot more drag. And so, we, we're not producing much drag at all, you can see our velocity is not going down, and we're quite an arrow into the ground here, certainly not slowing down enough to deploy the parachutes, uh, which are going to consistently be in red. So yeah, uh, maybe the Don't Say Putnik would be good to use for, for reducing drag on objects, but we're going to have to figure out a better system to go to space. This is obviously not going to be reliable. So that's the fate of the DB-1B, and we did not get any signs from that, so that was a shame. I decided to turn to other contracts instead of pursuing the same thing again, and here we have some focused observational surveys of Gale. They're not too far away, but they do require crew on board. Uh, we have to do a crew report, and so that's the trick. I decided to try something completely different because I saw that we had certain parts available that I have never used before. I have never tried the Hooligan Labs airship parts and I wanted to try them out. 
I was hindered in my airship design options by the fact that the SPH had a length limit on it and I didn't want to upgrade the SPH just yet, though I might have had enough credits to do so. Uh, so I was tweak scaling the parts and ultimately changed the way the tail worked because of suggestions. I actually recorded this during a live stream and so I had some suggestions from viewers. Thank you. And here I have a fire spitter propeller uh, in the back, a radial engine there. And I'm using the biplane parts from Fire Spitter in order to try and control this. We do need control surfaces on airships as well to uh, adjust attitude and all. And we'll see how that works. I was thankful for the airship build aid that was really handy and obviously had the correct planets there. That's excellent. And uh, I wonder if all those planets actually have atmosphere. I haven't checked that out yet. Uh, possibly if I had gone to some other planet except for Gale, it wouldn't have any atmosphere to allow the airship to work. But we can do some interesting exploration on that. Uh, it could be that we will be sending airships to other locations, if I can get this right. But we are early on in the technology tree, and there is uh, one downside to airships that I fail to consider at this point, but we'll see in a moment. On the bright side, it is very light. It's four tons right now, so that's a positive. The first real flaw in the plan was the placement of the cupola module at the bottom and uh, you can see what the problem is. It's balancing on that thing and it's too far forward. It really needs to be under the center of mass for it to balance on it. Uh, though you could put some other strut in the tail to help with the balance, but I decided to just move the cupola module instead. Well actually, because that's the root part, move the entire envelope, the airship envelope, forward. And so here we are with it properly balanced. You can see the airship control thing over there and I've got auto pitch on. Uh, not too sure whether or not that's a good thing but it probably helps. And here increasing the buoyancy. Uh, attitude, altitude control would probably be easier but I wanted to try it manually and you can see it's uh, well it's tilting backwards again. Not entirely clear what about the balance is causing it to do that, but eventually we get free of the ground and off goes Jeb. Now I think the Galileo plant pack had a had an optional extra to change the look of the Kerbals and I guess I've got that in because I think Jeb is looking a little bit different. We'll see whether I keep that as is or add some other spacesuits or stuff for them. Not sure yet. But the question is whether our engine works. And here I'm also encountering one of the other flaws of airships and using them for exploration. And that's the fact that they are very, very slow. But anyway, we've got our, our location targeted. And it's clear that we can turn, so control surfaces are working. I don't know if there's a reaction wheel built in, into this. It felt like it. It didn't feel like that was just the air surfaces because we don't exactly have much airflow going across them. It's only four meters per second right now. Um, but yeah, we are pointing in the right direction and it is time to fire up the engine. And here is another flaw. Uh, the engine is going the wrong way, um, right? We, we've got it on a tail and as a pusher prop, but it's not configured to be a pusher prop. And I find out that this particular engine, unlike other fire spitter engines, which do allow you to configure them as pusher props and reverse their direction, this one doesn't have that option. And so panic sets in. Uh, we're at 20 meters per second going towards the ground. You can see our altitude dropping and this is not good. At some point I got a suggestion from a viewer to turn around and just uh, fly the airship the wrong way around. Though, and uh, its body is symmetrical and I don't know to what extent the control surfaces are actually being useful and how much it's the reaction wheel. Anyway, we sort of bounce off like this. <laughs> good thing uh, it doesn't go very fast, otherwise that could have been a disaster. And uh, here I, I'm trying to turn towards the targets so that the prop... But the way we're tilted, it's still going to pull us towards the ground once I restart the engine here. We need to sort of level off and actually pitch down so that the propeller is pitched up. It's also very complicated. 
we can see our target location in the air there. Uh, I think that's Waypoint Manager that's helping out with all of that. Uh, so a big theme of this series is going to be trying out mods that I've never tried before. I've, I haven't used Waypoint Manager. I haven't used this airship stuff. I obviously haven't done anything in uh, Galileo Planet Pack ever. I've never done anything in 6.4 scale either, by the way. So this is my first experience on that scale level, even though it's very popular to do 6.4x. I haven't done it myself. So lots of new experiences up ahead, which means a lot of derpiness. Uh, I guarantee you that there is going to be some mayhem because I'm going to be doing things that I'm not used to doing. And it's an odd mix of mods too. Lots of new parts and who knows what dang it is going to do. I, I might want to increase the severity of that just in case there's a lack of mayhem. On the right side, it looks like I'm going to have a reasonable budget for for doing crazy things and to deal with disasters. So I'll, I'll feel... The thing is, if you have a constrained budget, uh, you don't feel free to experiment. But if you have a loose budget, as we have started off with here, it does encourage more experimentation. And so I hope to bring that to you. Ultimately, I decide that we are going too slow to actually try and do the observational survey over the target location and instead bring this in for landing. Based on our accidental knock into the ground previously, I figured that it'd be safe to go a reasonable speed into the ground, though I'm trying to moderate that to 6 meters per second. And there we go. So we park it and eventually recover it. For a first try, I consider it a success. After all, we didn't kill Jeb, so that's a positive. I was definitely worried about doing that, and I'll be, I'll be concerned about Jeb's welfare throughout this. I will be trying to keep him alive while still putting him in harm's way. But anyway, airship one, there was. Jeb got a ribbon. And so with that, I think I'll sign off and say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of this series. If you did enjoy this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.